e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā karanga maha, e hui hui nei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Ngāti Kahu ki Whangaroa te iwi, ko Otangaroa te marae, ko Hatia te awa, ko Parihaka te moanga, uh, ko te ropu nahinara te pāti, ko Bill English te rangatira, ko Paul Foster Bell ahau nō rera, no mai, haere mai ki te whare paramata o Aotearoa. Uh, to all of us gathered here, a very warm welcome to the New Zealand Parliament. Uh, I'm Paul Foster Bell, a Nationalist MP, and one of the Pacific Regional Representatives uh, on the Executive Committee of the CPA. And along with Deputy Speaker Kite from Samoa and uh, Nikki Rattle from the Cook Islands, I've got the honour um, to serve and represent our region. Uh, there are too many dignitaries here to individually name, um, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging you, Mr Speaker, uh, the ministers and MPs who are here uh, today, uh, but also uh, their excellencies, the heads of diplomatic missions and members of the diplomatic corps, and those who represent the many member organisations that are part of our wider Commonwealth family, Commonwealth Youth New Zealand and the Royal Commonwealth Society in particular. Can I offer a warm welcome to the Speaker of the Samoan Parliament, the Honourable Leo Pepe Taimaaiono Toleafoa Faafisi, Talofalava, Mr. Speaker, Manuia Le Afiafi. Welcome. Greetings also to your delegation of visiting Samoan MPs. Rest assured, sir, that though the climate may be cold here in Wellington, the relationship between our two parliaments, as you've seen, I think, on your visit, remains extremely warm. Special thanks also to His Excellency Akbar Khan, the Secretary General of the CPA, who has travelled all the way from London to be here with us this evening. Akbar has already proven an enormously capable CEO and is really moving the organisation forward to the benefit of our member branches in our region, which are often small and modest in their financial means. Akbar has made significant progress in directing the CPA's resources away from administration into much more uh, delivery of very useful programmes which advance our uh, shared values of just and honest government, democracy, transparency, human rights and international peace and order. So thank you very much, Akbar, for being here. It gives me great pleasure to also welcome our keynote speaker for this evening, the Right Honourable Sir Don McKinnon. Sir Don is known to most of us Kiwis as one of our most senior political leaders during the fourth national government in the 1990s. But from 1978 to 2000, he was a member of this house. From 1990 to 96, uh, served as Deputy Prime Minister and for nine years as the Foreign Minister of our country. From 2000 until 2008, Sir Don was Secretary General of the Commonwealth, receiving our country's highest honour, the Order of New Zealand, in 2008, and was made a Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order, a gift, uh, a personal gift from Her Majesty in 2009. Given the impact of the seismic shock of Brexit, the ongoing ramifications of the Trump presidency, rapidly evolving US foreign policy, the slaughter in Syria and the nuclear threat in North Korea. It's easy for us in our part of the world to relax and sit back and think ourselves very fortunate to be so distant from the troubles that beset other regions. So now is an extremely timely opportunity to hear Sir Don's views on democracy in the Pacific and the potential threats to us, to it, and perhaps wake us somewhat from our slumber. Thank you all once again uh, for coming this evening. Uh, kia ora tato katoa. My thanks indeed to Paul Foster for that very warm welcome and a very good afternoon to everyone here. I do want to recognise the Honourable Sir Don McKinnon, the Honourable Speaker, the Right Honourable Speaker, David Carter, I also want to recognise the Honourable Speaker from the Parliament of Samoa, the Honourable Ministers, Members of Parliament, Poto Williams, Member of Parliament, who's the Vice Chair of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, the Pacific Region, also members of the Diplomatic Corps, and I want to recognise and thank members who have come from the academic community as well as the Commonwealth family. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here in Wellington. It's my second visit to the National Assembly as a guest of Right Honourable David Carter, and it's always a great pleasure to be here in New Zealand to see the valuable work being conducted by the CPA branch. Today, we are going to be treated to the second lecture in the series of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's lecture series that was launched in London in 2016, in December 2016, by 
Baroness D'Souza, the former Lord Speaker of the House of Lords. This evening, I'm delighted the second lecture in this prestigious series is being hosted by the Pacific region, and in particular by an eminent Commonwealth parliamentarian and international statesman, the Right Honourable Sir Don McKinnon, on a thought-provoking topic of dark clouds over democracy. The ambition of this prestigious Commonwealth parliamentary series is to offer members a unique opportunity to hear the views and reflections from distinguished parliamentarians, such as Sir Don, who have made an outstanding contribution to their nation's democracy, to the Commonwealth, and to the institution of Parliament, and to all that which it represents as an outstanding public service and parliamentary leadership. This new initiative from the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association will not only contribute to the CPA's continuing mandate of knowledge transfer within its membership, but it will also provide an important, and I think a valuable historical record in itself, reflecting the views, as it will, from the distinguished Commonwealth public figures on the adherence to the Commonwealth's political values. In future, I hope the complete series of lectures will serve as a platform to inspire discussion from a variety of stakeholders, whether they be students, political scholars, parliamentarians, or civil society, both at the national and international level, on the importance of democracy in our Commonwealth and also the other values which we hold dear. Distinguished guests, the Commonwealth occupies, I believe, a very special place in all of our hearts. It stands for enduring, universal, and timeless political values. Values of democracy, human rights, separation of powers, gender equality, good governance, and the rule of law, amongst all which are captured in the 2013 Commonwealth Charter. The theme for the 2017 Commonwealth Lecture Series is the promotion and implementation of the Commonwealth's enduring political values, challenges and opportunities. And the topic which Sir Don has chosen, Dark Clouds Over Democracy, I believe strikes very much at the heart of the Commonwealth's relevance today and the importance of its political values to each and every one of us. Parliament is the key pillar of any functioning democracy. In fact, it's hard to imagine what kind of democracy can exist without an effective parliament that scrutinizes governments, ensures transparency, and promotes good governance. And as we look across our Commonwealth today, the challenges facing parliaments and legislatures, large and small, to embed good governance, transparency, and democracy, and to ensure an enduring relationship of trust between all citizens and parliaments and parliamentarians never been greater. When I was last in the Pacific region in 2016, I had the great opportunity and privilege of meeting the Honourable Speaker of Tonga, Lord Tuivakano. He talked about the survival and strength of parliamentary democracy, and he said its survival and strength depended on the ability of presiding officers, parliamentarians and clerks to meet the challenges and to adapt to change. As an international community of over 180 Commonwealth parliaments and legislatures, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association has, for the past 105 years, been at the forefront of helping parliaments and parliamentarians navigate common challenges together and to find solutions. And I believe this, today's lecture is in that long tradition of sharing and exchanging views and navigating those common challenges which are ahead of us in the 21st century Commonwealth. Thank you very much, Sir Don, for agreeing to deliver this lecture. And thank you very much to the CPA branch of New Zealand National Assembly for this excellent um, opportunity to hear more about our Commonwealth values as part of the Pacific region's contribution to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's lectures. Thank you very much. Kia ora tato talo for lava. Uh, my greetings to all that are here. Thank you, uh, Paul Fosterville, for your introduction, Mr. Secretary-General of the CPA and your colleagues, ministers of 
New Zealand and Samoa. Uh, Mr. Speakers, both uh, parliaments, all parliamentarians, all guests and everyone else, I, I greet you all very warmly. And uh, standing at a slight stage of shock, thinking that when I arrived here in 1978, uh, and I figured that after 20 years that would be enough I could say good goodbye to this place. But um, it's a very special place. And when I was asked uh, to participate in this, debate, this uh, lecture series, as any member of parliament knows, anyone who asks you to give a lecture six months away, yeah, yeah, fine, no problem. <laughs> and then suddenly two months out you think, why the hell did I... Uh, and realising, you know, one is dealing with a subject that is very wide, very deep, and uh, could occupy us for hours and hours. Well, that the latter is not my intention. But I did think it was worthwhile commenting on how I have seen many of these trends uh, change over the last uh, couple of decades. Dark clouds over democracy... I add it was democracy, not democracies, uh, because I see it very generally. And I hasten to add that I do not have a problem here with the New Zealand Parliament, especially not in an election year. <laughs> so it is a question of being probably fairly wide sweeping. I want to talk about you know, how, does, how do democracies actually present themselves now? Uh, is it the best thing that is going for us? Uh, the fragility, the fragility of all democracies, no matter how long they have been around. The issue of the democratic culture, and I really do think the democratic culture is often more important than democracy itself because it is what will sustain. And the difficulties that democracies are challenged with uh, because... Establishing a democracy is actually very easy. Sustaining it through difficult times is where the challenges come in. And then, well, are there any remedies? Are there any remedies that we should be looking at? For those of you who may have uh, read uh, Francis Fukuyama's book, the end, of, uh, the end of whatever it was, The End of History, you know, he had the view that liberal democracies would just take over the whole world eventually and that would be it. And, and, and you know, we had reached this uh, destination, we had reached this nirvana, there was no need to uh, look beyond it. Well, take a look around us now and you see that very many challenges are there. I'm delighted the CPA has uh, taken this on board. The CPA is a very, very useful organisation, and I think I can say quite candidly, for members of parliament, anywhere in the Commonwealth, it's probably their first experience of international relationships. And even for that, re for that, for that reason alone, it is a very good organisation, very strong organisation, and the time that I was in the Commonwealth Secretary, they were just a wonderful partner to have. Um, the general theme, as you, you said, uh, Paul and Secretary General, the promotion and implementation of the Commonwealth's enduring values, just and honest government alleviation of poverty, fundamental human rights, international peace and order, global economic development, rule of law, separation of powers, reflects that sometimes almost too many people want to get involved and add things that are very necessary but for many countries can be very, very challenging to get across the line. And I'll come to that a bit later. So what I'm talking about here is very much in a, a broad canvas. And one of the appreciable things about the Commonwealth itself is that leaders get together every two years and reinforce those values. And leaders can't be replaced at those meetings. It has to be the leaders there. And that makes it a very important to ensure that those values are sustained. And if nothing else, the Commonwealth really does have that level of moral authority which has been used many, many times, not always necessarily very publicly, but used in a way where it can be said, Mr President, Madam Prime Minister, you signed up to these values and look what you are doing now. 
and that authority has, has, is of gr great benefit all the time. In my time as Secretary General uh, of the Secretariat, without a doubt, one could see every day all around the world the benefits of democracy. And you could also see the downside when you did not have a democracy, when whole sections of different countries, different sovereign states were marginalized and were outside the process because of skin color, religion, language, ethnicity, and a whole host. So that's where, for many, the challenge of democracy goes right back to the very beginning. What does it actually mean? What does it mean to any given country that aspires towards democracy? And first and foremost, the people must be heard. Not some of the people some of the time, or all of the people some of the time, but all of the people all of the time must be heard. And if they are marginalised through those categories I suggested to you before, you still haven't crossed that line. Democracies must also accept leadership changes. And that is a challenge in many parts of the world, as many of you would know, that it's a wonderful thing to have elections. You can have a free and fair election, but suddenly, after the election, when the votes are counted, there's a rejection of the votes, there's a challenge to the votes, there's a rejection of the new leader. This is part of the problem that we are facing all the time. Again, look, we don't think about it in New Zealand, but it is very fundamental in many, many parts of the world. And that comes back to this, as much as anything, what I would call the, the maturing of a democracy. How long has it taken to reach that stage where you just accept? And look, I can say in New Zealand that we have an election, there can be a change, there might be a change, there will be a change, but there's not a revolution the next day, there's not riots the next day, trucks aren't overturned and that sort of thing. That is democracy because we accept it. The other thing is we come back to this point of, well, you know, how do you get to that point? And no matter which way you where you begin, it does be, it's education, education, education. And I often cite a study that we did in the Commonwealth just a few years ago. Uh, a very wonderful colleague, a friend of mine, a Nobel laureate from India, Amartya Sen. And he talked about the single identity issue. And the single identity issue was if you, as a, a person, just have a single identity as being a a cattle herder in, in, in Kenya, or you, you happen to be an athlete somewhere, or you happen just to belong to one church and nothing else somewhere else. If you just have a single identity, you become very vulnerable to anyone who looks at that identity or challenges that identity. Where you have people with multiples identity, you, you not only belong to this uh, religious group or you belong to this linguist group or something else, but you carry multiple identities, you don't have anywhere near the same problem of challenges from within. And what we're seeing a lot in the, in the Middle East now is challenges to those single identities. People that believe that their particular branch of a religion is the most important one and a threat to that is a threat to you and your family forever and ever. And therefore you've got nowhere else to go. And one of that whole area of education which becomes so, so important. It used to bother me when I loved work I did in Pakistan when having convinced the Pakistan government that it was important to have people who were well educated prior to becoming into positions of uh, responsibility in, in, in the parliament, they did a sort of an end run and produced all these uh, degree certifying institutions known as madrasas. So if you had been to a madrasas for a solid Islamic education for 15 years, you were, you were therefore qualified to be a member of parliament. And so hence the structure of that parliament becomes so weighted merely in favour, well, not just Sharia law, but everything related to that particular faith. And it wasn't until we sort of got past that point with, with the leaders in terms of the broader education needs that you could see some daylight at the other end. But the evidence that 
many have produced that if you do have democracy as we know it, as it's expected to be, the chances are you will have higher standards of living, you will have higher levels of education, you will have greater opportunities for everyone in the country. Now, uh, I will come to China later given its rapid movement up the uh, income scale, but overall you can say democracies have led the way in terms of people's livelihoods, education levels, opportunity levels, income levels, a lot. So, so there it is. But I come back to the um, title of what I said, the dark cloud over democracy. Is there an erosion of this democracy? Well, the academics are having an absolute field day on this one. Uh, just about every think tank and related to government are doing their analysis on every country in the world just how democratic are they? And, you know, do you tick various boxes and various things like this? And, and we've referred to these categories before. And then they'll add many more categories. But the best, um, the best reading of this that I could figure out from a number of these think tank productions, the year 2000, we probably had, they reckon, about 120 democracies. Now, that's 120 democracies out of about 190 countries. So it was certainly better than half, but it wasn't certainly all the way. By 2005, it had dropped to 100. 2010 dropped to about 80. Now, 2010 is seven years back, so is it still slipping? It probably is in some cases. Uh, should it be a bother? Well... It should be a bother, but if you're not personally affected by it, it's not a bother to you. You saw the referendum in Turkey just uh, a week ago, and uh, the, one of the most biased referendums that could have been held, I recognise members of the diplomatic corps here, and I do not have a government responsibility now so I can say these things, but given that 90% of the advertising for that referendum was in support of the government's position to change the constitution, Anyway, if you're going to get that kind of result, there will be a lot of people who will say, well, thank goodness, because it's not actually harming me at all. And we've all been, I think every member of parliament, I bet, has sat in a hall somewhere when someone has said, you know, what this country needs is a little bit of a dictatorship. You know, it's like you, you can't be a little bit of a dictatorship, you can't be a little bit pregnant, you can't have a little bit of a dictatorship. And the answer always is, of course, well, fine, but if that dictator comes along and takes your farm away, you're happy about that. And that's what dictators are. They, they, they can literally do anything. So, yes, people will be disturbed by loss of democratic or categories within democracies if it affects them. If it doesn't affect them, they're inclined to say, well, I can get by and this is just politics as usual. And sometimes it is. But what do people really want? And if there's one answer that you can get wherever you go in the world, look to the, to the people who have got very little in Somali or, or, or in uh, Kenya, places in, in the Middle East. If one thing people say, I want something better for my kids than I've got. If there's one thing that you can squeeze out of them, when you really say, well, what do you really want? Something more than I got. And how are you going to get that? Mostly, you'll only get it through that democratic structure. But that comes down to this, you know, the development of democracies. Where did they come from? How did they emerge? And what we do know is that they do take a long time to mature. And they are changing all the time. I mean, we can trace ours back to the 1850s, I guess. But it's probably only since the 1940s and 40s and 50s that we even allowed the word human rights to come into part of our democracy. One thing that is very obvious is that this democratic structure that we are familiar with here and is very generally accepted throughout the Western world is very much just that. It is very much Western world. And that's the thing we've got to think about from time to time when it doesn't always fit. The round peg doesn't always fit into that square hole. 
Because, look, no matter what, whether you accept religion or reject religion or think yourself as atheist, we are the, we are the product of 2,000 years of the Judeo-Christian ethic and the overlaying by the Athenian democracy. It has been in our system for 2,000 years. But that doesn't apply to people who are not part of that world of the Judeo-Christian Athenian democracy. And in many cases, we're still trying to impose that on those that it is still very much an alien system where you start spreading the powers or separating the powers. And, and I used to see this time and time again, particularly throughout Africa, where, you know, for a millennium, people always recognised the one big chief. There was never an alternative chief. There was never in an opposition chief. There was one chief, and everything descended down from that. So it's never easy to then say to these people, this is a better system. Yes, you can show them what the system can do. You can show the benefits of the system. How do you meld those systems together? And it's developing that, that culture around democracy over a period of time which will work. In different parts of Africa, and I've often used this one quite openly and candidly, you've got a, a large bulk of states which I call Anglo-Africa. You have a large bulk of states called Franco-Africa. They're about equal, about, about 20 states each. And the history is interesting. They all were basically colonized and then decolonized at the same time. The French never quite like to loosen completely. They, they do have far more sort of commercial and political linkages even after they have um, given independence to those states. The British decided, well, we've got to give it away, we might as well give it away, so here's a constitution, here's a structure of parliament you should do and try this and try that and have an election, and away it went. The result was very interesting if you look over a 50-year sort of time span in that in Anglo-Africa, the democratic structure was put in place, the new president was installed, Two years later, there was a coup, and then another military coup, and then democracy came back again. Then a few years later, another coup, democracy came back. I mean, Nigeria, I can just about count the leaders as they went back and forwards, back and forwards. But, I look at Nigeria, uh, you learn from your errors. And they have had a pretty good democratic run now since 1998. They have learnt to understand that you've just got to keep getting the system right to a point where the army no longer sees itself as a major player in the democratic field. And that it applied, it applied in Ghana, it applied in Sierra Leone, it applied in Cameroon, it applied in many Southern African ones and Eastern African ones. Francophone Africa, on the other hand, and, you know, the French did have that much greater linkage. Yes, they were independent, but the commercial linkages were strong, the political linkages were strong, and Paris would get quite nervous when an election came up, and they would make it very clear who they really wanted to be the leader. The consequence of that is you haven't had the chance for those countries to learn through their mistakes. They are still dealing with the, the godfather or the godmother in Paris, which is telling them how to do it and what to do and which way to do it. Uh, look, it'll come right eventually. There is a great deal more assertiveness now internally in Francophone Africa. And the best one was, I think, in Togo just a few years ago when uh, Iadema died. He'd only been there 38 years. <laughs> uh, he died and his son took over. And, of course, the country rose up and said, he's not entitled to her. This should be another election. Well, you know, thousands of people were killed as a result. But the African Union stepped in and said, the people are right. Mr. Iadema Jr., you must step aside and let the people say who they want. 
That was a huge change in Francophone Africa. And I can just see it continuing slowly as you go around. So it's building that culture that people are prepared to invest in and know. I think um, I was dealing with uh, a number of problems in a little country in southern Africa called Swaziland. And they had reached a stage where, A, the king was always paramount, and he just about decided everything. He picked the cabinet, he picked the, he picked the members of parliament, and uh, even though they did have their own constitution from the time of uh, independence. And I had many discussions I had with uh, <coughs> His Majesty saying that I think it's time you, you really went through the process of another constitution because, again, the constitution they had was dropped, on, dropped down from Whitehall. Here's a constitution, pretty simple, you know, do this, do that, and everyone will be very happy. Well, is it, you know, people aren't very happy when someone else writes your constitution for you. I said to, look, Your Majesty, I think I will send you two people from the Secretariat. And they were both very senior African diplomats who worked for me. They will come down and they will, with your three or four people, go around the country and find out what do people want in their own constitution. And it was a very successful exercise. Because, and it took the better part of a, a couple of years, but they went to every village, every little hamlet, talked to the people, what do you want, how does this compare, what about this in the constitution, that in the constitution. And of course, in a case like Swaziland, you have a hierarchical tribal group, as well as a lot of other people, so, and members of the royal family. So you're trying to meld all these together uh, in a way which basically they all find acceptable. So, of course, when you, when you go around to talk to these people, they will give you some of the, their very basic concerns. And one was, you know, we want something in our constitution to be able to control the number of goats each person shall own. And I thought, oh, this will be good. Uh, anyway, I said, well, if you want it, put it in. So they put in this clause about uh, the number of goats that you could own, how you could graze these goats and things like this. Now, what I was also doing, which I'm sure will make Geoffrey Palmer relax a little bit, I, I would take this document back to London about every three months where I had three, Geoffrey knows these, these constitutional specialists, very intensive people, very, you know. They, anyway, they went through this thing and said, what is it? This, you can't have a constitution that talks about the control of goats. But I was ready for them. I said, haven't you read the Magna Carta? Because <laughs> the Magna Carta says, you shall not put a bridge across my stream. I said, this is what we're dealing with. These people are starting at the very bottom of developing a structure which the whole country can manage. Now, I've got to tell you, finally, that constitution, I think the the goat's clause survived and the whole exercise was eventually passed and it hasn't been challenged since what was it, um, 2006. Uh, the previous one, and the other, the other one I had to change was that their judiciary, I mean, you can probably laugh at this one, the judiciary, again, set up with the help of the British and their good neighbour, South Africa, five powerful judges they were all white African judges. You know, how do you expect these people just to sit there and accept? But of course they were told this is what was normal. So slowly I found the need to replace these and I found senior judges in other parts of Africa who would be prepared to serve on the Supreme Court there. And again, there's been no challenges to it. But these, that is only 10 years. These things take time. And I wouldn't say for one minute that Swaziland is a stable, small, monarchical democracy, anything but. But it is holding together, and the people certainly believe that the work they put in to, to establish that constitution, it is their constitution. It doesn't emanate out of Whitehall or the Cato Say or anywhere else. But let's look at this. Um, why is there such a reversal in attitudes towards democracy. 
Well, you know, you can get actions by governments, whether it be the executive, the judici judiciary or the legislature or political parties. I don't think there's an executive anywhere in the world that doesn't constantly push against its own boundaries. It's the nature of an executive to want to push against the boundaries. The boundaries are usually the legislature and even sometimes the judiciary. Uh, but it is that acceptance of those borders between the, within those separation of powers does really underpin a democracy and that you can't do something. As President Trump found out with his uh, travel visa ban, suddenly he couldn't you know, fancy a judge telling me I'm wrong. Uh, but that, you know, when I first heard that, I thought, well, that, that, that is working. Yes, they've got a long way to go yet, but that is working, and it's so important. I was dealing with one president in Africa over quite a long period of time who, um, who occasionally would find the, the uh, decisions of the judges totally against his, uh, his own opinion. And so he'd fire them all. And I said, you can't fire judges. You know, you can impeach a judge. No, but they, 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 they don't understand what I'm trying to do. I said, they do understand. That's why they're, <laughs> what's that, why they're ruling against you. He's no longer the president of, <laughs> president of that country. But it was a case of bringing in often other judges from other Commonwealth jurisdictions to play a part to, to be able to say to the local judges, you don't need to accept that. And that was very useful. Because, again, it's that sort of educational role that within the Commonwealth, and the, you know, one of the great advantages of the Commonwealth, we all speak the same language, not the English language, it's the judicial language, the legislative language, the executive language, education systems are the same. Yeah, we, we, we know what each other's are doing, and that's, that's very beneficial. So, but when executives take more power than what they should and literally are challenged... Uh, in the streets, you know, you have got a problem. And that's where the maturing of the democracy and the democracies that accept, uh, and all democracies will accept an occasional pushing on the, on the borders of, of the authority, but not of a permanent nature, not where it's diminishing the others. And as we've seen in many cases, the uh, issue of absolutely <laughs> marginalising a legislature, even though it may have been freely elected, but if that legislature is not permitted to play the roles the legislature should, you know, support the government, fund the government, challenge the government on a regular basis, the legislature may as well not be there. I always like the uh, quote of, uh, I think he was the third American president, James Madison, who said, when you set up a government, give it very little to do. And when the government's in place, make sure they're watching each other, that they're not doing too much. And that was the, the basis of that structure of the federal system, to not allow the central government to override what he said was the importance of the states. And of course, if he hadn't been able to do that, the United States would never have existed because you were never going to get agreement from all those states on, on everything. So they all had their own level of authority. But the external forces against any state can challenge democracy, whether it's, whether it's a war, whether it's terrorism, global financial crisis, economic collapse. And it is the true long-term culture of any democracy where that will survive. But going back to those number of countries where democracy has diminished in the last uh, 20 years, you will always find usually a weak, a weak or weakened legislature or a weak or a very weakened judiciary. Uh, and if the, uh, you, you, you will have, obviously, permanent problems as a result. Even though now we seem to be in the age of the celebrity culture when it comes to politics, uh, the structures there pretty much must be the same. And the trend of authoritarianism, we've seen that many, many times you can, in, in, in Russia. Uh, Duterte in the Philippines, where presidents are just taking authority and being permitted to take that authority uh, against generally the wishes of others. But again, people think of their personal situation, well, it's not going to hurt me, it's not going to affect me right now. And that's where we, we do have to bother a little bit. 
But where to from <coughs> where to from here? I was interested. I think there was a program recently on television about you know people are losing interest sort of thing, and the Vox Pop was all about no, I don't even vote. No, I couldn't care less what goes on there. That didn't actually bother me too much, because when you really do put a challenge in front of people for their own future, they, they really will come out and vote. And I think it was the young woman who said, no, no, no intention of voting. Uh, you know, if she had four kids and her local primary school was being challenged as something or other, she would be voting. So, yes, people can get very lazy. After all, voting in the United States now is, oh, I think it's almost below 50% of the actual registered population. Uh, ours is holding pretty well, Mr. Speaker, probably 72 or 74% or something like that, which is not good, but it's, uh, it's reasonably respectable uh, within democracies generally. Uh, and every generation sees things very differently, and uh, the current generation who are most of their information, you know, is coming from that thing they hold in their hand all the time. Uh, but that is the very much the challenge of democracy, to be able to meet people's expectations and ensure that they are part of the debate, that they are informed about the debate. Because if you do confront young people with, would you rather have this or this, they will tell you. Uh, very, very emphatically, they will tell you. But if it's not motivated to go and vote, uh, we are the poorer for it. What should we do about it? I've been, always been a great believer that we should teach civics in the high schools. I was the product of a four-year American high school education where you had to do one year of American governments, governance, one year of American history. That was mandatory. And I probably know more about the Kansas-Nebraska Act than I do about the wars in the Wairau Valley. Uh, but I think civics, making sure young people do understand what it is all about. And you've, you've got to be quite serious about it and not just treat it lightly. It is very, very fundamental to the way we have grown up. And I say it's 2,000 years within our DNA of believing in the, in the paramountcy of the individual and the rights of individuals as against the rights of larger communities. So, yes, education. Voting age, suddenly we, we hear thoughts about maybe it should be lowered. That is a debate worth having. That is definitely a debate worth having, whether it should be lowered in our case to 16. I'm not too sure which way I'd vote right now, but I think it should be actively encouraged to talk about that because if, in fact, a 16-year-old will vote, does that make it a habit that they want to continue? I don't know, but this, is, this, this to me is worthwhile thinking. Political parties... Um, again, I'm not going to focus on New Zealand, but political parties in many parts of the world can do a huge amount of damage. They can do a huge amount of good, but they can do a huge amount of damage. How do you get beyond that? Transparency of funding, transparency of membership, transparency of their constitutions. Yes, they have to be part of the process in a formal sort of way. In the absence of any formality... Uh, yes, the problems, the problems can become immense. I did not also note here uh, tying aid to democracy. Uh, now, this was a big thing in the Commonwealth, and it's a big thing for New Zealand aid, I know, is that you want to encourage democracy, and in a way you, you try and help do it by virtue of aid programs anywhere. And in the case in the Commonwealth, we, we would be all the time workshops on, on, on the judiciary, workshops on election, uh, running elections, registration of voters, those sorts of things. All designed to make people be aware of the benefits of being part of it and growing up with it. Not something alien, not something that just happened once every three years or four years, but something you were part of. And therefore, the need to... I don't like to uh, say, you know, we will not fund your education, um, primary education reconfiguration programs unless you do this, but you can do it in a sort of a softly, softly selling basis and, and it usually works. There's also a significant role for senior statesmen and women. 
a number of people said to me, well, do you think Helen Clark's going to get not another job? I haven't seen Helen for a few years. I'm not sure she'd want another five-year job at the level that she's been doing, or eight years in the UNDP. That, I mean, that was a huge job. I, I, I say quite publicly, head of UNDP is really number two in the UN. You have enormous clout, and she had that. I don't think she wants... Anyway, but people like her, with that authority, there's enormous number of things people like her can be used for, and other former presidents, prime ministers, even foreign ministers, uh, working with countries over a sustained period of time. And I do underline sustained period of time. You can influence amazingly. And I'm speaking only in terms of my two years, of five or seven years. But in some cases, you will have that slightly immature democracy that's all the time fragile, but if you've got a sort of a godfather, godmother there who comes in from time to time and encourages them to do this, try this, Mr. Speaker, try this, Mr. President, try this, Madam Prime Minister, keep it moving forward quietly. <coughs> Those people, the Helen Clarks or others, you know, they have enormous, enormous moral authority. And used right can be very, very useful, but it's got to be sustained. It's got to be sustained and not just... You can't just do it for six months. And I also comment on that, that, um, and I had this when I was dealing in the, the peacemaking in, in the Maldives, is that UN sent an excellent person who got along, I was working with him and with the Commonwealth, and, and he was doing so well there, then the UN suddenly wanted to put him to, send him off to somewhere else. And I, I, got a, I rang uh, Ban Ki-moon, and I said, look, can we just have him for another year? Oh, well, you know, so, so we lost him. And I thought, well, it doesn't help. He, he, he had built up such a reputation with the political parties there. I mean, we, we love the UN for what they do, but it's not helped when they drop someone and then suddenly pull them out and believe that they, oh, no, we've got, we've got, this, we've got this diplomat from, Czechos from the Czech Republic. He's very good, very good. You know he's going to take another year to get everyone on side. And that's, that's something that... Um, that uh, I think the UN could be a bit more cautious about, but I know it's a huge bureaucracy there, very difficult. My last point is um, you've all heard, or you've, those of you who've been to New York, you know, you've got the Security Council here, the, the, um, the, what, the, the ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council over here, and the Trusteeship Council over here. Two enormous cavernous rooms. Security Council, obviously, the busiest. The politics is very strong over here. This one has been redundant, obviously, since about the early 1990s because all those trust territories have now gone through to democracy or independence. I've always taken the view that we need something of a council, and I've just used the old trusteeship council, to act as a hand-holding exercise for countries who have probably semi-collapsed or are collapsing or under threat from the outside uh, but not quite at the level that they get addressed by the Security Council. It's not a, it's not a major security issue. It's a, it's, a, it's a lack of good governance. It's a lack of good uh, support. It's a lack of uh, economic opportunity sometimes. But a council that has that authority to be able to get alongside some of these failing democracies and work with them. And it's not a two-year job. It is a 10 to 15 to 20 years job. And when you, start, when you see it in that light, um, I hope you'll appreciate the point that uh, none of this is going to be easy. None of this uh, works that quickly. We're very lucky in New Zealand we've got what we've got, but there are hundreds, hundred, at least 100 out there who are all the time just on that fragile state. So thoughts for you. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there is an opportunity now for questions. We only have five minutes, so we'll probably have time to take about 
three or four questions. So do we have any questions for Sir Don from the floor? How are your remarks kind of reflected in China at all? Very good point. Um, I did say I'd come back to it, and I could see someone walking around back there. I thought, I can see my time's up. So, um, look, China has had great gains in the last, what, 20, 25 years. Um, it hasn't had 10 minutes of democracy in 5,000 years, <laughs> and it's not about to have it tomorrow. But I can see already there's a burgeoning middle class coming up that are just pushing the boundaries now. The first sign of pushing boundaries in, in a totalitarian state is nimbyism. And suddenly the central government is finding we wanted to put a railway line right through there and they won't let us. Or a road, or this, or that. Now that has just started in the last four or five years. But that middle class is becoming very wealthy. Look, they have achieved in 10 years what took the United States 40 years in terms of doubling, trebling incomes. So, right, no democracy in China, a little bit at the ground level, but I take the view that it is changing very slowly. And I learned as a foreign minister dealing with China, you don't think in one or two years, just accept they think in 100-year cycles. Uh, it is on the move. Uh, whether whether, um, whether the, the Communist Party will decide that's more, more than what we want to happen, I don't know. But yeah, you can't build up, allow middle class to build up where I think 12 million tourists leave China every year and go around the world. We get a million, or half a million of them here. You know, um, they're on the move. And therefore, they, they will see and they will go back and they own two cars and they got an apartment and maybe a second one they will clearly start pushing those uh, political borders. Thank you very much, it was fascinating. I'm sure just like you, um, I'm sure as you did in my age, I'm in the political system, and so. <laughs> and so I often come to these events and find myself somewhat dulled. That was very interesting. I grew up in uh, Mozambique and Kenya and have worked a bit in Lebanon, and so I'm somewhat familiar with only semi-democratic countries. It's interesting coming to New Zealand, though, where you see a nation that is founded so much on democracy and where it is an example to the world. But in New Zealand, as with other nations, like you mentioned, there's a decline in engagement. Uh, would you say that when there's less than 50% of the population voting, there is actually a fundamental question around the legitimacy of a government? If you think, regards what Hobbes or Jean-Jacques Rousseau would say, there's a, the social contract is very um, tenuous there. Well, this, this, this brings up the, the issue often of, uh, you know, should we have uh, compulsory voting? Uh, we have compulsory registration. I'm not aware anyone in Australia has been prosecuted for not voting or here for not registering, but we have it. Um, sh should the country, should the government lose legitimacy if you drop, drop below 50%? Probably not. I mean, look, there has developed such a, in the last probably 15 years, more so, it was the sort of the Clinton Blair when we, the so-called third way developed, like, governments that tended to be right of centre economically, left of centre socially. And that's now become the, you know, the synthesis has become the thesis. But there's no real antithesis now, is there? There's no, other than what probably saw in the States, the extreme right going to Trump and the extreme left going to Sanders. So the, that's still taking shape, I think, but I wouldn't worry too much. People do come out very vociferously if they are really affected by something that, that touches them. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had an extraordinary second lecture in the CPA uh, parliamentary lecture series uh, from Sir Don this evening. Um, not only have we had a great New Zealander and someone of significant international stature, um, but clearly a, a draw card given the number of ministers, members and other very, very busy people who have come along tonight to see you, Sir Don. So can we once again uh, thank Sir Don for his time this evening? <laughs>